So, hello everybody, my name is Janus Kapp, and I will be talking today about uh, how I created and overall about creating Windows Syscall fuzzers or fuzzer. First of all, who am I? Uh, I am Janus Kapp, I work in Glenerfed Security, it's a Estonian company, we deal pen testing, uh, red teaming, some research, all this kind of stuff. I have some background in finding vulnerabilities, both in websites and some in uh, usual software. Uh, this year, last year, I was lucky enough to be in top 31 uh, in the Microsoft Research Center. But this is not important. Let's talk about this talk. First of all, I will give some introduction uh, how and what syscalls are, how they work, and how this information can be guided over to creating a fuzzer. Uh, and some background on that, then a little bit more about how I build it, the fuzzer, uh, then about the actual fuzzing and the results. So, uh, let's start really from the beginning. Why is this called fuzzing? Well, first of all, like most of my research that I do, it was because it was interesting. Attacking the kernel seemed something that not a lot of people do, and, well, it seemed fun, and I thought that I would learn a lot of new things doing it. Secondly, it's because of practicality and everything connected to it. Uh, Privit's escalation has become much harder in these days. Uh, it used to be quite e much easier to escalate your privileges in Windows. In these days, it is much more difficult. And it works also against sandboxes. A lot of software these days work in sandboxes, meaning that if even you manage to take over some application, for example, a web browser, Adobe Reader, you still are inside the sandbox. Your possibilities inside the system are hardly limited, heavily limited. And for breaking out of that, there's two options. Either you attack the other processes that are connected to this sandbox and try to take over the container part, or you actually attack the kernel and break out the sandboxes this way. So, when you start talking about fuzzing the syscalls, we are actually to talk only about the first two execution rings. We don't talk about really deep ones that much. We talk about only ring three and ring zero. Ring three contains, well, the user code, your programs, your browsers. Ring zero uh, contains the kernel. And for switching between them, there is system calls. If usual, computer program wants to do something that is inside of kernel functionality, it will make a syscall to kernel, and kernel then does anything that it wants or needs. So system calls give control to kernel. How they act exactly are architecture dependent a lot, but the main logic is something like this. The parameters that is wanted to give to the uh, syscall inside the kernel are put into the either registers or stack. In case of x86, for example, it's everything put to stack. Then the syscall number, because its syscalls are numbered, are put into some register. x86 case, it is put into AAX register. Then the uh, code invokes switch to kernel mode. This is uh, a special uh, machine code commands that will do it, opcodes. Uh, then the kernel takes control of the execution flow takes this register that contains syscall number, and based on that, executes some function inside the kernel. When it finishes, uh, the value, return value is uh, given stored, and the kernel returns to user land, and the return of the syscall. This is the basic logic. Now, switching in case of x86, uh, there are like, in past and overall, there's like four main possibilities to do it, the switching into kernel. The interrupts that were used uh, quite some time ago, but they are kind of slow. Then call gates that are not used because they are not that portable. And then there are special uh, machine code opcodes like syscall and syscenter to go to kernel and uh, sysret and sysexit to go out of that. Now, uh, there are two different because one is used by AMD and the other is by Intel, but they pretty much do the same thing. Now, the system call numbers, uh, the numbers that are defined by, uh, this is a little bit different in different operating systems. For example, in BSD, OS X, Linux-based systems, they don't change. 
if open file has uh, syscall number five, it is it now, and it was same 10 years ago. In case of Windows, the syscall numbering changes constantly. So the main point or uh, logic behind this is that in Windows, syscalls are never meant to be called out directly by any program. In Linux, you, of course, you can do it. It has been done a long time already. But even in Linux, late times, they are usually called out by APIs and libraries, not directly. So uh, to make things simpler, I will focus only on the little bit more simpler part of the Windows, Windows x86, and will describe uh, syscall fuzzing based on that. x64 is pretty much the same. The same methods uh, work, but it's just easier to start from here. And additionally, with x86, if you fight, write a syscall fuzzer for x86 and don't call out the syscalls directly, but do uh, it through the wrapper functions, then you can actually fuzz also kernel uh, uh, Windows x64, 64-bit Windows, because of the, how Windows supports 32-bit uh, programs also. But anyway, uh, system calls, in this case, are push, uh, parameters are pushed into stack. Uh, EDX will uh, register, gets the value of ESP, the stack pointer, and uh, register EAX gets the syscall number. And after that, the syscenter is called. That will initiate the Windows syscall. Now, uh, those syscall numbering are located in two different places. If uh, you are interested what syscalls exist in Windows, you have to do, take a look of NTDLL TLL file and uh, Win32U TLL. All of them contain wrappers to syscalls, to Windows syscalls. And the code numbering, uh, in case of uh, current example, NTDLL has numbering from 0 to 1C1, and Win32K, which is Windows uh, like uh, additional uh, syscalls, are from 1000 to 1460F. Of course, on excess. <clears throat> and to get them out or to get this information much easier, you can use IDA Pro combined with some Python. Because you can really like, you can write Python scripts that it, uh, it gets this information from those DLL files. Those scripts are really easy to make because the syscall wrapper structure is always the same. So you can really easily take a look of export table in those DLL files, get the syscall names, get the syscall. Uh, syscall numbers, and even the parameters. But only the number is not enough. If you want to make some syscall, then uh, you need the number or the name or the, and the location of the wrapper, uh, in what DLL the syscall wrapper locates. And then you need parameter count, how many parameters this, this syscall wants. In x86, it's really easy, because uh, Windows uses uh, std goal standard, uh, std goal uh, conversion meaning that all the parameters are put into the stack. So you just take a look of the function and see how much that, and since std call uh, standard uh, means that the function that is called out will push back the stack after it's ending, you can count how many times it pushes back the stack and based on that calculate how many parameters it expects. With x64, it's a little bit more harder, but also doable. And then you need parameter types, what parameters are. But about this a little bit uh, later. So yeah, like I said, uh, just use IDA Pro, a little bit scripting, and export table of those two TLL files, and you get all the numbering, parameter count, and names of all the syscalls in Windows. Uh, so yeah, like I said, uh, a uh, Windows API uses std call uh, calling convention, meaning that parameters are always in the stack. And if you take a look on that example, this is oh, free virtual memory syscall. Uh, this is the main function that is called out. This is call, and this is actually calling this one. But like you see, EAX registry gets value 125, meaning that this syscall call number is 125. And here, you can see that ESP is moved to EDX. Additionally, uh, IDA Pro does it automatically already and take the symbol information also. But you if they wouldn't, you would see that return 10H, meaning that the stack is rolled back by 
10, uh, 16 bytes, meaning 16 divided by 4, this function has 4 parameters. What about parameters? In machine code, uh, x86, all the parameters are actually integers. They're simple integers, 32-bit integers, nothing else. The meaning behind them is important, but in essence, they are still always just numbers. But important things about them are, are there parameters? Are they meant for as input parameters, or they are meant for as a parameters to get data out? Additionally, are there simple integers, like just uh, some number that the function expects, like index or something? Or is it a pointer to somewhere inside the me uh, memory space? If it's a pointer to somewhere in the memory space, what is expected to be in that location? How big a memory block should be in there? How it should be structured? And so on. So in essence, uh, there are such examples what the parameter can be. It can be simple integer. It can be a pointer to some integer. It can be pointer to some string. And in Windows case, it can be pointer to usual string or white chart string. Uh, it can be pointer to some structure. It can be pointer to some random memory block. So all of those possibilities exist. Uh, additionally, uh, not only these are possible, but even if the input is a simple number, it can be a handle. So what is needed is, is parameter types, uh, then type information. Like you might know that this is this type of uh, parameter, but you don't know what this type means. Is it uh, if it's pointer to somewhere? How big? How big it is? If it's just integer, how big integer it is? One byte, two byte, four byte? Is it a handle that has to be asked from some other function inside the Windows? Is it a enum uh, so it expects to have some particular value? Is it optional? Optional meaning can it be null? Simply null? And if it's a pointer to some structure, what is the well structure of the pointer structure? All this information is important when you start bu building uh, Windows Syscall Fuzzer. And this is imp information that it's bloody hard to get. First of all, let's start with the uh, most uh, logical place, uh, Microsoft documentation. Well, since you are never meant to call out any syscalls directly, this documentation of Microsoft doesn't cover it that much. You still get some information, like uh, similar functions and structures and all this kind of information you might find but not that much. Now, Microsoft debug information is much better. With this one example that I showed you in IDA Pro, it already named all the parameters, because it asked uh, Microsoft uh, debug symbol database or server for information about those D DLLs. And some of the DLLs and some of the uh, syscall functions have debug information. It gives the type of the parameter and name of the parameter. Now, not about all. And when we talk about Win32K, then about this TLLs, there's no symbol information from Microsoft Server, uh, debug symbol. Now, uh, additional information, especially about structures and genomes, can be found from simple uh, Microsoft development tools. For example, tools that are meant for developing drivers. Those two uh, source files and header files <coughs> might contain information about uh, structures, genomes, and data types. Uh, but most of the information, when I gathered it, uh, came from unofficial documentation. Uh, for core kernel, the undocumented NT internals was really good information source. It contained a lot of information about the core parts of the Windows kernel, about the syscalls, and everything. There was also. Uh, Process Hacker tool that had really good documentation of Windows uh, syscalls and React OS documentation. But at the end, a lot of functions don't have very good definitions anywhere publicly available. Only you have to yourself reverse engineer part of the kernel or at least calling the, those DLLs and see how these DLLs are called out, how the parameters are used there, and find out what is the parameter types and what this syscall does. And in some cases, one thing that makes it a little bit easier is since all the syscalls have wrappers around them, the wrapper names might indicate what this function does and maybe what the function has as the parameters. But this is a lot of work. 
Now, uh, when I was starting to create the fuzzer uh, for uh, <coughs> Windows kernel syscalls, I did it in two parts. Uh, the first part is Python. Python a script that I have, our tool, uh, generates basic logic how each syscall is called out, what parameters are used, how the memory is allocated, and everything like that. And then I have other program written in C++. It's called Executor. And it will execute this information that is gathered together by the Python script. So it actually calls out syscalls, makes allocations, and everything. Uh, reason for behind this is twofold. Uh, first of all, it was easier to write uh, quite uh, difficult logic inside Python because it was faster to develop. Secondly, I needed separate programs because this program that calls out the syscalls will crash quite often. Because some syscalls might overwrite some of its memory because the fuzzer itself doesn't know anything about what some syscall does. It just knows the parameters and how to use them and so on. So some of the syscalls cause the main program, the main executor, to crash. So it was in two parts. And to communicate between those two parts, I created a Sylphan execution language. Sorry. That teaches uh, the executor to do a couple of things. It teaches the executor or tells the executor to allocate named variables or pointers, just memory blocks pretty much, allocations simply. To allocate buffers, to allocate strings, uh, to modify buffers, uh, to build up the structures, uh, then execute TLL methods, execute syscalls directly. I don't use the direct execution much, but through the wrap wrappers. And additionally, lately, I have used added uh, racing threads creation for situations where kernel will handle some part of the memory, and some other thread can in the same time change it, and by that, changing the kernel behavior. I haven't found any vulnerabilities based on that but uh, in kernel, but I have found in drivers, so I thought to throw it in. Simple example of such language is just uh, f uh, three lines of code that call out uh, great Windows AXV function from user32 DLL, just as example, and then show window uh, function from user32 DLL. What pretty much the first line does, it's, it creates a variable shut memory block called type and put string static inside of that and in white character or format. Then it calls out create Windows XV a function using some number parameters and this type variable and then show window. What it in real life, if you execute this code, then what in real life happens is just window blinks up for a second and then gone because after the three lines, the executor will close itself. But this is the main logic, how the uh, calling out the functions and everything and memory management is done uh, between those two elements. So uh, when I was creating a cell phone, uh, the generation part, done, uh, this part done by Python, it has a lot of definition and a lot of information about syscalls. It has their code, which is not actually used, but uh, location of them in uh, what DLL, the parameter count and types, about each parameter, are there in or out parameters or optional parameters? Then additionally, you have definition of types, like for example, u long means four byte in, uh, integer, or uh, byte means one byte uh, integer, for example, these kind of definitions. Then definitions of all the structures that the uh, syscalls might use. And then some helper functions to just generate handles, because uh, you can generate them recursively also, but this was more fast, more faster. So I don't know how well it is visual, but pretty much all the syscalls are defined in Python own format, just in uh, dictionaries and everything like this. Then, for example, in this case, you have a syscall called NT set timer resolution that has three parameters. First with type u long, second with boolean, third with type pu uh, long, so it's pointer u long, and information about are they in, out, or optional parameters. Then about all the structures that might be used are such structures, uh, such definitions. Uh, now structures might contain other structures, and structures might contain pointers to other structures. So if you build it up in a memory, you have to do it recursively. 
But this is the definition how P security descriptor uh, structure is built up. It has seven, seven uh, elements and their types and uh, names are not actually important, but it's easier to later analyze that if you see the names also. And then you have definitions of native types, handles, and enum values. Uh, no. If we talk about the actual numbers, how many of them is, and why this project took so many time, uh, so, so much time for me, was that the main logic of the program I probably wrote in a week or two. The rest of the code and rest of the time, months that I put into it, was gathering information about syscalls, their structures, the bar meters, the names, the all the data types, everything like this. Core kernel part, the kernel part that is handled by the NTOS and kernel EXE in kernel, uh, it has 450 syscalls. I still have missing uh, definitions for 15. It means already 1,829 parameters that one by one had to be pretty much manually, mostly manually, typed in and configured, 68 structures, and 148 data types. Now we move to Win32K. It has 934 syscalls, 349 is missing the uh, definition, 3,160 parameters, 161 structures, and 145 data types, meaning that if 161 structure is mentioned, about each structure, this kind of build up had to be mostly manually researched from the internet and put it to correct format. From core, core kernel one, some stuff couldn't be done automatically because Windows uh, symbol, uh, Microsoft symbols uh, managed to do some of the work automatically, but most of it was manual work. So how we combine all this information and generation logic? Well, first of all, there's a loop, like it's always in fuzzing. You first pick the uh, loop, the script, automatically uh, generates or chooses random syscall from all those syscalls. Then it generates parameters, like uh, integers and strings, it generates randomly, or based on some rules, but currently there's uh, no rules. Then it generates all the structures, allocates enough memory, puts the structure elements into their places. If it's recursive, so it points to somewhere else, it builds those up also. So it's a huge tree of logic going on. Uh, then some handles uh, are generated from helper functions, and additionally it does some mixing, like in 5% of cases it uses wrong type, for example, just to see if maybe something bad happens. And after it executes the syscall, or actually before it sends it to executor, it always looks what are the out parameters of this syscall. If the syscall has out parameters, it might use those out parameters as an input parameters to next syscalls. So it will be kind of a chain. And then it executes it. How it uh, looks like in uh, the action, let's say we have NT translate file path syscall. It has four parameters, P file path, which is a pointer to a structure that is in uh, input parameter, U long, uh, which is just a four byte uh, integer, it's also in parameter. And then you have two out parameters, uh, p file path and pointer to u long, or pointer to four byte integer. What the generator does, it takes those parameters and it knows that u long it can generate automatically. Uh, p long it can generate automatically because it's just pointer to some uh, string. But the p file path, especially the first one, has to be constructed because a pointer to structure and the structure is constructed separately. So it opens the p-file path structure cont content, how it is built up. It has, uh, let's say, four elements, but it's not actually correct to define it by four elements, but it has first three u-longs, or three four-byte values, and then it has some random length. Well, it's not actually random length. If humans looked at it, then it's probably the size of the length element. But the code doesn't care. Code just makes, OK, I'll generate some random length string. Uh, and generate such a such, uh, memory block that contains numbers and everything in such a structure. And then this becomes actual functions, how it is called out. And 
because the last two parameters are out parameters, they are not filled with data. They are just allocated, and the pointers are given as a parameters. They will be filled up with information, like this output of this function. And when you have those out, function, out uh, parameters, then you can combine them and reuse them later when calling out other syscalls. So actually, uh, currently, now it's a demo time, I think. So uh, first of all things that I will execute, I will turn myself like this. I will demonstrate how the fuzzing of Win32 part, because this is actually visual. It gathers information, just waits for a second, and then you can see the windows pop out. The uh, reason why windows pop out is that windows handles are heavily used in Win32 syscalls. So it creates a windows, and it's like actual visual. But better part comes in a second. Oh, well. Do like this. Maybe. Now, just to demonstrate, I updated this Windows today morning. It has the latest patch in 64 bit Windows. Windows 10 to fully patch, no additional drivers except uh, uh, virtual box drivers. But this is fully patched. Now, just to demonstrate. I will keep the monkey picture up, because otherwise you couldn't at first understand if something crashes, because it doesn't have any visual impact. When I'm running the core kernel part, then you don't see that something happens, because all the syscalls are not visual. You don't see anything happens. Well, the monkey types, types. Now I have to be a little bit honest. Let me see. It might take a little bit. I hope that not that much anymore. Huh. Well, doing live demos is fun. Let's see, wait a little bit more. It's interesting, I tested it like four times before coming on stage, and it crashed the windows. But it's interesting, nonetheless. Let's try it just again. Well, life is like this when you have, oh, OK, now it worked. Uh, what it happens uh, was, uh, yeah, uh, what it happens if, yeah, you can see nothing pretty much works when I click. Uh, this is a syscall uh, vulnerability that I found in Windows kernel. Uh, and this is actual reason why I can't make this tool public as of yet, because the like reporting and fixing process is still in the works. But after this is being fixed, I will make the Sylphen tool public. Now, uh, this part actually happened in the core kernel, which means that all those protections in Chrome, for example, other, other tools that actually block the Win32K uh, syscalls don't work uh, against this. 
type of uh, things. So, and in past, I will cover one additional thing. So there's additional things that you have to keep in mind when you're doing such a fuzzing. Uh, first of all, you should use spatial bool. What spatial bool is, is pretty much the same as full page heap. I will describe it in a moment. Secondly, if such a crash that you saw happens, and you just closed the file and gave it to this executor program, after the restart, this uh, file that you created and contains the way how to uh, repli replicate the crash, doesn't exist or it's empty. Because blue screen of death means that some files that are currently in cache are not written in the hard drive. I found it out bad way. It's really annoying to actually find your first kernel level crash, and then the file to replicate it is empty. So yeah, uh, flush all the files inside into the hard drive when doing such a fuzzing. Uh, then there are problems of hanging processes. Uh, which means that some of the functions might hang the executor program. You just have to kill it. Uh, then there's uh, the executor program syscalls might overwrite st stuff inside the executor program itself, meaning that this will crash. And I have had experience with WTF crashes also, meaning that kernel crashed. You found a reason. It was during the switching of contexts, and you can't replicate it. Uh, so there will be crashes that you can't replicate. It might be a question of timing. It might be a question of some virtualization issues, something like that. But you will have crashes that are not replicatable. Quick introduction of what the spatial pool is. It is like um, page heap, meaning that uh, it catches both buffer overflows and use after freeze, for example. How it works is, in normal life, you have memory by pages, not allocated, not allocated. If you allocate or ask for memory, one block is allocated, and your memory allocations are put into it uh, piece by piece. Now, if you have multiple allocations inside one page, and you cause overflow in one of them in the middle, then it will not cause a crash. Or it will cause a crash probably, but later. You can't figure it out where the actual issue happened. What spatial pool means is that one al uh, Per one allocation, one page is allocated from the uh, physical memory or mapped to a physical memory. The second um, page after that is uh, marked as not accessible, and your allocation that you made is put in the end of this first page. And now, if the overflow happens, it will overflow to the blocked page, and CPU will start the execution, blue screen of F, and everything else good. Additionally, like I said, blue screen of death uh, messes stuff up. You have to flush uh, files to hard drive that you are being modified. Otherwise, no proof remains. Of course, you can later like um, take the information from a mini dump file and based on that, analyze and understand where the crash happened and in what syscall. But you don't still have the first thing that caused this issue. Like I said, uh, hanging processes like suspend trade, wait for something, uh, those whole syscalls might hang the main executor program. You kind of have to just kill the uh, executing process in that situation. Uh, then overwriting variables, like I said, random crashes inside the executor itself. So how to combine them all together? Uh, how the process looks like? If of course, if you just want to find some crash, you don't have to automate it. You may let it run like I did and just wait until something happens. But what the logic I made is, uh, was I first activated auto logon from Sys internals to, so the computer pretty much logs in automatically. Then the fuzzer starts right after the login, checks for crash dumps. If there are crash dumps, it uses CDB, which is a command line uh, Windows debugger uh, tool. Uh, to analyze this dump and then store it somewhere else with the information about where the crash happened and so on, and the file that caused the crash. Then remove the old crash dump and start fuzzing until it crashes, and then all 
from start again. Also, uh, one CV uh, I bring out as an example. Uh, it was uh, from last year. It was uh, in Syscall renamed Transaction Manager. But actually, the same issue had was the same issue was not in Syscall itself, but something behind the Syscall, one of the drivers. And this uh, thing could be called out by multiple uh, Syscalls. But this was the Syscall that I found it in first time. And this Syscall to took two bar meters, uh, P Unicode string, and LPQID. So pointers to strings, well, it's pointers to structures. The P Unicode string structure has such a setup two 16 bit uh, parameters or elements, length and maximum length. And then after that, the pointer to white char bar buffer. Now, white char is an integer type that is used by Windows to represent characters. It has two byte value. It has, is two byte value. Now, length is measured in bytes. So length has to say how long the buffer is where the string is. Now, based on this logic that the ele element of the buffer has to be two bytes, and length is measured in total bytes, it means that length should always be even number. It can't be uneven, because its sub-elements are always two bytes. What my father found was that in case when you give uneven number into this length, uh, then wrong size of allocation is made inside the kernel, because it expects and behaves totally normally if you have even numbers, because it's logical only to have even numbers. But if it doesn't, it calculates the allocation size incorrectly. And after that, the buffer overflow will happen in kernel. So uh, additionally, uh, some future developments. Um, overall, actually, I would really like to uh, rewrite the entire self fund, because everything I have written, uh, overwritten this self debugger three times. And I want to make it fourth time, because I think I would manage to do it even better. Uh, then I would think about adding a tool to record syscall, like uh, how other programs do syscalls, and input some random variables inside of those calls. Uh, then using uh, sub-elements of structures as input parameters. And I would love to extend it to the Linux systems, because in Linux systems, it's much, much easier to get information about uh, syscall numbering, uh, syscall parameters, and everything like this. This data is already marked up, and there is there already. Additionally, what is not written here, I'm actually thinking, uh, after some time, to create a website or wiki or something that starts describing all the elements, all the syscalls of the Windows kernel, just to have a place where uh, I and others can gather this information. Because now it's gathered around in multiple places. I'm sure that some people have this information at home. But someone who wants to do such a research, gathering all this information and putting it in some format that is reprodu reproducible is pain in the ass. And next time, if someone fa uh, wants to write uh, Colonel Father, I want him to not spend that much time on doing that. So that's all from me. and. Is there any questions? Uh, is there a microphone? Sorry? Uh, yeah, uh, about recovering if you get a crash that what syscalls you have run and what has caused the crash. Can you pre-calculate the, pre uh, the syscalls beforehand, save them to the disk, and then execute them? Well, pretty much what I, uh, is, it is what I do. But the uh, problem with uh, recovering the syscalls is if you don't have the actual file that executor executed, uh, then you don't know the syscalls before the main syscall. Now, yes, you can is, uh, save them one by one before and create a huge chain, but this will cover much space. And actually, since you can do like 100 or more syscalls per second, it will fill up the hard drive pretty much. Yeah, yeah, you can start deleting them, but I didn't find a reason for that, because it's easier just to always flush to the hard drive 
and uh, do the syscalls in a little bit huger blocks. Yes, uh, the problem is that when I, uh, some syscall was done like five minutes ago, and now the second syscall is done, and the first one caused the second one to crash, yeah, then, then it's messed up, that it can't find. But maybe this is one possibility that can be done. This is a good idea, I think. At least worth trying. Okay, but uh, I will be here entire today, and if anyone have any additional questions, please let me know. Thank you.